Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Guns on Pegs podcast. This episode won't be your typical episode. It won't be Chris and I mucking around and having a drink as we usually do. Uh, in fact, Chris isn't even here. Instead, I'm joined by Digby Taylor, who looks after the shoots on Guns on Pegs and Shoot Hub. This episode is aimed mostly at the people who run shoots, shoot owners, gamekeepers, that kind of crowd. But if you are a gun, we would encourage you to keep listening because what we're going to be discussing will most likely have an impact on you as well. The topic we're going to be talking about is avian flu, bird flu, if you like, and the impact that it's having on the forthcoming season. Digby, it's great to have you back on the mic uh, after several seasons now, but um, not perfect circumstances. (laughs) Yeah, thanks, George. It's great to be back. Um, funny enough, last time I was on the podcast was season one, I think, talking about coronavirus. Does that make me some sort of viral expert? Um, <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I'm fulfilling the Chris Whitty role a little bit. Um, well, just tell me when you, when you want your next slide. But um, let's hope that you don't end up being a virus expert. Um, bird flu diggers, we're talking about bird flu today. Can you just give everybody very quick explanation as to why we thought it was necessary for us to do an episode about this? Yeah, thanks, George. I think there are a couple of reasons, uh, really. And the first is general awareness. So I I speak to a lot of shoots weekly. I probably speak to about 50 shoots every week. Um, And funnily enough, I'm still coming across shoots who don't really know what bird flu means for them and their season yet. I think the news is breaking, has broken pretty quickly over the last couple of weeks. But there are still the old people out there who don't know what's going on. Um, That's the shoot in terms of guns. It's a, you know, a whole nother world. There are still loads of people who don't have a clue what their season's going to look like. So general awareness is important. Um, we don't want people to be unaware and therefore um, take unnecessary risks. Um, but the main reason probably is to talk about the future. We, we know we're in a tricky situation, but what can we do as shoots to minimise the risk of the future? And we'll speak more on that in a minute. But that's, um, that's really why we've got our guest today. George, am I allowed to... Um, Am I allowed to welcome our guest? Yes, yes please do. Brilliant. Um, our guest today is the chairman of the Game Farmers Association. We'll refer to that as the GFA. Um, he comes from a family who have farmed game birds for generations. Chatting before, actually, I think I'm right in saying, George, that um, that George Davis, who's our guest, um, is part of a family that has the longest uh, running, continual line of game bird farming in their family. So I think they've been... been uh, game farming since the um, 1800s, I believe. Hear, hear more on that in a minute. Um, I also reckon George is probably the most clued up on the bird flu situation out of anybody in the country. Um, information straight from the DEFRA meetings have been fed straight into George at the GFA. Um, so a very warm welcome to George Davis. Thanks very much for coming on. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. George, it is very kind of you to join us and to take the time. Um, I'd imagine that you're pretty busy at the moment um we've asked you on to provide a bit of insight into the whole situation where we are where we're likely to be going but i think it's probably a good idea to start with what's already happened as digby said there's a lot of people don't really know what's been going on so maybe to begin with you could just very briefly summarize what's been going on with bird flu here and in france like when did it first become apparent that there might be a problem so if you, uh, yeah, there's a few questions there, but um, the very first we were hearing about it was the end of February. And uh, we were hearing rumours that uh, there was multiple cases uh, in the Loire region, which is where predominantly most of the game farming's done in, in France. And um, it was about, very quickly, it, it, it built up to about 18 reports of, of uh, avian flu there. To put it into context, last year, up, up until last year, um, we would sort of have a few outbreaks in our country. But last year, we had 26 cases, uh, which is the worst we've ever had it, ever in history. This year, in the UK... We've had, I think it's now 118 cases as of last week. This is this is in in poultry, and then you have on top of that you have um, the wild. What happen, is happening in the wild? And we've had over a thousand cases. I think most most counties in the country 
have had wild cases. Um, so we're talking, what, what, um, yeah, 26 last year, 118 this year in this country. So just in the UK, we've seen a dramatic um, increase in, in avian flu. And normally this would be reported in the media like in a frenzy like they normally do but because of obviously because of other reasons um it's it's a bit of a hidden story um so yeah going back to um france uh back in february we, we were sort of hearing about 18 cases and then this was suddenly as we were going into march this was uh gaining traction in that area and, and we were seeing over 100 cases a week in that area that's sort of half the size of Wales or so. Um, and it wasn't before long we had 500 cases and it just kept on going on and going. And, and at the time, it just thought it was like a bomb going off. And we were all wondering how the hell is this going to roll out? It was it was such a fluid thing. It, it, it became incredibly difficult. I mean, it, it must have absolutely saturated the French authorities because um, how they tackle that amount they were they were killing millions of birds and having to do all the cleansing down um and you know protocols were being thrown out the window i i gather and they had to design new regions they had to uh, uh, so normally you have like a protected zone and then a, a um, surveillance zone but they they decided to come up with a much bigger uh, regional zone so all of this was just uh, unprecedented. I remember speaking to a few game farms in the UK, one, one in particular who had to cut a lot of their um, laying stock. And it's, it's worth saying that it's not a pleasant experience, is it? I mean, we can talk about the numbers and the statistics and that sort of thing. And I'm, it's, it's absolutely, you know, this is people's livelihoods in France and in the UK. Um, for for, is, for any farmer, I mean, you saw this back in the foot and mouth days. Any farmer having to see his breeding stock being slaughtered, it's it's the worst thing. The, you know, it is. You know, people might think it's a bit silly because he might be out, out shooting or whatever. Um, but it's when it's your own breeding stock. It's that, that's the stock that you nurture on a day to day basis. Um, that is your livelihood. It's um, th there's a lot of investment. And, and um, to see that happen, it's, it's devastating. Yeah. yeah. And for people who don't fully understand the, the, the supply chain for, for game birds in the UK, can you explain why what happens in France is a problem for game farms and shoots here in the UK? So this, this, uh, this, this goes back, really. And, and what's happened now has, has actually, in my mind, set us back 30 years. Um, if, if you go back 30 years, there was probably only about 50, 60 game farms up and down the country because it, it's not easy doing the whole program of breeding and rearing in, in the UK with our climate, particularly the further north you go. So uh, obviously the French have a, a much better climate, uh, particularly in, in that region we were discussing. Um, but um, uh, the... It's not just the climate that the French have um, really made made it work over there. Um, they they're very good at uh, cooperating. Uh, they're very good at uh, coming together and um, making something bigger and and dare I say it, better in this case. We we were facing back in the sort of seventies and eighties a, a number of issues in 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 our sector, and and one of them was the thing of catching up where people at the end of each uh, season were catching up the stock that they were putting down the year before and the year before that, but the ones that probably weren't flying so well. And so we, we, we were getting this progression of, uh, um, of not such good quality stock. Sort of selected breeding in the wrong direction. Exactly, exactly. And so um, the French had... Uh, picked up on this and um, they with proper breeding programs and satellite farms um, they uh, set up their, their cooperatives now one of the reasons this really works is is there's a bit of history here because uh, in, in in Europe when you sort of hand down your 
your uh, your wealth or your assets, you tend to split it equally amongst your your children. Mm. Uh, whereas in the UK, it's sort of more going to the the first son, isn't it? Um, and so there's there's lots of little farms over there, which is very difficult to earn. I, I remember when I was at college um, many decades ago, we, we were taught that um, the average uh, European farmer, 60% of them had other jobs in those days. Um, how, how can you earn a living off a small bit of ground? Um, well, this lends itself very, very, very well. I mean, the, uh, the co-ops over there set up their, their uh, systems and um, the small farms provided the labour and um, it's given them a very good income and they've built up a, a very successful um, industry. Because of that, uh, they, they've been basically um, uh, producing, we reckon, about 80% of all the red leg partridge in this country and at least 50% of the pheasants. So that really puts it into, into pretty solid terms as to why what happens in France is a problem over here if 80 percent of the the partridge stock isn't coming and uh or you know if there's if there's a challenge there then then you know making up that supply is very difficult and i think think from my conversations it's really the partridges that are worse affected there's more uh, pheasant laying stock in the uk than there is partridge laying stock um and those who have their pheasant breeding stock have been able to up their production a little bit to cope, to, to fill in a little bit of the, the losses from France. Because we, we're so short on partridge laying stock in the UK, I think, George, because of the, the reasons you mentioned in terms of um, well, everything you just discussed, the partridge situation is more dire than the pheasants. Um, I've, I've heard numbers banded around that we're about 80% down on partridge and probably about 20% down on pheasants. Would that sound about right? I've said so many times in the past, we've always tried to guess at what's going on. Because uh, if you can imagine, our job is literally counting your chickens before they've hatched. How how do you, where do you go? You know, it's, and you, you're trying to constantly review the market situation every year. And, and uh, nine times out of 10, I think most people get it wrong. Um, but uh, in this case, I think um, you, you're, you're not far off. There's so many different factors. Yes, people might have, got a, a few more stock other game farms were down on st stock initially we've seen um i've been talking to various vets up and down the country and we've seen a bit of disease um and um egg production's not been so good in certain areas and and better in others um so it's it's really difficult you know you, you you've got so many different factors um it's not just about having number of hens it's the production it's the hatchability uh, uh, so on so yeah yeah so so th th there was this outbreak in france and that effectively put a stop on all movement of eggs and chicks from france until that outbreak was dealt with and in the past so what is the current state of play in terms of movement on eggs and chicks because there's been a lot of talk about that in the last week or so hasn't there yeah, this is where it gets really complicated. There is a lot of um, an unknown, I suppose. If we go back to when I was saying, you know, we have the protected zones and we have the surveillance zones, and then they created this new zone. There was um, all of the, all of these unprecedented uh, situations uh, in France, and whilst we knew certain laws. We didn't know how this these new zones or this new zone in particular was going to be applied to the original laws. Now, one one key thing is this 90 day law. The 90 day law was set up for the uh, European bloc many, many years ago. Importing poultry products in, into Europe, particularly from third world countries, you can imagine their biosecurity is not as high as ours. So they put in this law to um, help with that. So there's a, instead of the usual 30 days, um, which is within uh, the block, um, they were having to apply this 90 days. Now, of course, when Brexit happened and the UK came out of the EU, we suddenly found ourselves as a third country 
and shackled with this 90 day rule. And so that 90 day rule is 90 days between the the last case and when you can ex when you can move eggs and chicks is that right? Yes, uh, after after that there there has to be this 90 days. Within the EU it's 30 days. There have been cases right up until last week. I think last week was the first week that within that um, region that there have been no cases, but I think there's one or two cases in France. So the the question is, the big question that's always been um, an unknown is when that clock started ticking. Nobody's told us. So uh, presumably, if there's been no outbreaks in that lot in that region, presumably the, the clock started ticking last week. 90 days or 30 days, we're not seeing anything coming for at least 30 days from that clock starting. And I think it's, it's worth um, outlining what the sort of from egg to pulp is not a case of a couple of weeks, is it? I, I feel like there's quite a few guns out there who think that um, the pheasants get magic out of hats. But when, when an egg enters the UK, it's then 28 days incubation period. 24 to, 24 to 25 days. Then you've got seven weeks on the rearing field. And then we don't shoot our partridge until they're 18 weeks old, roughly, is that right? Yeah. And um, our pheasants until they're sort of 22, 21 to 23 weeks old. Yeah. So it's a, it's a fair old chunk of time from eggs arriving in the UK to um, the, the, the season starting. Yeah. So basically, September and October shooting has been dramatically affected by this. And now, and now we're, because of the 90-day rule, assuming it started um, last week, we're looking at... I think I did the maths the other day. We're looking at um, if eggs come in at the end of this 90 day period, we're looking at our first shootable bird halfway through January um, from France. And then, of course, you can't rear a, rear a bird um, too late on in the season. Yeah, it's not happening. Yeah. There's one thing that I hadn't mentioned, actually. We, we, we did press the point at an early stage, you know, this is going to cause catastrophe within our sector we have to do something about it and Dominic reported this to to DEFRA um, at the NAD call um, meetings that he was going to and um, so they they were looking into the possibilities of, of doing a license and this is where it got very complex the French game farms were actually also talking to their authorities and the idea was if they could take some eggs and quarantine them in a, in a safe place for 14 days. And if everything's well from there, we were looking to get a license to move them from there to the UK. Now, this is something that DEFRA were committed to. From, from our point of view, we thought, wow, this is, this is very progressive. Um, so if they were to be moved... The prob- there was multiple problems, though. First of all, they had to go to a designated hatchery. And at the time, I think there was only two in the country, but um, there was three or four clambering to get them. And I think we've got about six or so uh, in the country now, which isn't enough. Basically, it was going to cause a bottleneck straight away. But once you got over that hurdle, there was another hurdle because... The, the chicks going from those designated hatcheries had to go onto game farms that were also had uh, applied a license for. And, and the biosecurity at the time was set basically from, from a, a, a poultry point of view. So at the time, there was no game farm in this country that could, could uh, apply this because basically they, they, they were sort of uh, asking for sort of completely sealed um units you know um ours ours is more of an extensive type of rearing so anyway after a lot of work from uh various game bird vets uh and and the gfa and and uh defra they they managed to change that to a more workable process but unfortunately it, it wasn't to be it wasn't re- regarded i mean the number of cases in france it was just so vast they just felt that they couldn't do it and 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 if we were doing that sort of thing, it would have been dangerous politically because if there was an avian flu outbreak because of it over here, 
then the poultry industry would be very upset at what we were doing. We had to tread very carefully all the way along. Uh, it was very, very difficult to communicate the whole thing because it was so fluid. Um, there was so much discussions uh, at DEFRA and so many discussions with DGAL, the French uh, authorities. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a, enough feedback from there for one reason or another, but we are now actively trying to do something about that. Do you think that's something that we're going to be able to change in time for next year? Because we've got some some people saying, um, passing around sort of... Uh, documents we need to sign and send to our MPs to lobby them to change the rules for this year. What are your thoughts on that? Is it too late? Uh, what about next year? You know, we have been pressing the point uh, within within DEFRA. The NGO had actually also applied pressure to, to the ministers. So um, between us, we were, we were sort of pressing the point of, of what's going on. You know, this is devastating for our sector. Um, but it did seem that f- for all of our efforts over the years uh, and uh, even now maybe that DEFRA didn't have a full understanding of of what we're doing in the countryside. And, and this is something that the GFA are, are working on. In fact, in March, we approached, uh, there was a, a private member's bill set up by Lord Randall. And um, so we invited him on a game farm and we've been discussing with him and subsequently we've now got uh we've been engaged um in conversations and and hopefully we're, we're setting up uh, more um visits onto game farms by various uh labor peers um liberal democrats and uh, ho- hopefully um conservatives as well so we're we're, we're trying to cover um all, all elements there so it's it's really it's really important that we we have a, a united front on this so if people are doing that then what's the harm you know and if it helps people feel that they're doing doing something then that's got to be good um i don't know at the moment how we can change the law i think if this was if this was christmas and we were the turkey industry and we were trying to put something on the table Desperately, there'll be MPs lining up to score points to help us. But when it's when it's when it's sort of releasing pheasants to be shot in the countryside, it's a bit of a hot potato, isn't it? One one of the things I think we've got to talk about more when we're talking about this bird flu situation is the rural economy as a whole. I mean, we all know shooting is worth over two billion. I think it is to the rural economy. That figure is taken from two thousand and fourteen figures. Uh, when they had the pace report, how much how much more has the industry grown since then? I mean, <laughs> this. I mean, I heard at one stage it was growing seven percent year on year. I don't know whether that was the case, but um, it, it's got to be much more than that, much more. And that, therefore, it's not just the guns who can't get. Well, it's it's not the guns who can't get shooting. I mean, <laughs> that's obviously. A, a shame, but that's a, a leisure activity. We've got to spare a thought for all the keepers and shoe owners who've lost their businesses overnight. Um, and just on that, um, I spoke to Helen Benson from the Gamekeepers Welfare Trust the other day, and their Jamie's helpline um, is absolutely fantastic. Um, I could not, re- you know, if you're struggling coming to terms with this this situation this year, or you know someone who might be, please, please point them in in. in uh, in touch, put them in touch with uh, the Gamekeepers Welfare Trust. They're doing an absolutely fantastic work. It's not even just the keepers, though, is it? Um, and and shoot owners. It's also the local pubs, local hotels, local news agents, cooks. Pickers up, beaters, yeah. And I was going to say, I just wanted to add to your Gamekeepers Welfare Trust as well. I mean, shooting is a community. If you're a gamekeeper, you're part of a network of local keepers. There's the guys you went to college with. There's the places where you did your uh you know your apprenticeship or or whatever it's really important in times like this that everybody talks to each other and that you check in on your mates as well because gamekeeping can be a lonely job you know you're often doing it by yourself i think it's really important that everybody looks out for one another and if you're worried about someone in particular you know do 
get on the phone to them and have a chat and point as Digby says, point them in the direction of the Gamekeeper's Welfare Trust because they are there to help. And and also what I'll do is I'll make sure that it, when we upload this episode in the show notes, I'll put a link to the Gamekeeper's Welfare Trust and the phone number for Jamie's helpline so that that's right there for anybody who's listening to this uh, and feels that they need to use that. No, good. Now, uh, George and, uh, and George, two Georges, I said, I said at the beginning that I wanted to talk more about the future than dwell on the past. And it's, it's really important that we've covered the, the backstory to it. But um, certainly from the people I'm speaking to, shoots I'm speaking to, they're asking whether this is a one-year blip or, I mean, the coronavirus came back again and again. Do we think it, that bird flu is going to be an issue that hovers over us for years to come? What can we do about it for next season, for example? So, yeah, it obviously has been devastating what, what's happening. And, and people are reeling from from this like it must be literally like watching your house burn down in front front of you the the reality of of avian flu has been there for some years this has been a bomb that potentially could have gone off at any time the the number of cases that we've seen have dramatically increased over the last few years and it is highly likely to be here for some some time it's not just going to go away and as you pointed out it could be like covid in the in the way that we we're going to have to learn to live with it so that's the reality of it um and it's it's not not an easy thing to um really uh grasp maybe at this this point so what do we do if we're a shoot or a game farm that has previously relied on France for um, for, your, for their eggs. Um, I've heard people talk talking about going to to look at other countries, you know, Hungary, Spain, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania. If you look at the the history here, and, and you speak to the majority of game farmers and shoots, there's there's a lot of loyalty. Um, you know, if you've got a trusted supplier that's been supplying you for year upon year upon year, th- there's this uh, built up uh, loyalty. And, uh, you know, the question is, do you just walk away from your your um, your, your provider, your, your game farm in this situation? Do you just walk away from from this or do you uh, re-engage it? and and like anything it's it's how people have handled the situation you know it's not it's it's not anyone's fault as such um and you know a lot of people have been saying i've been let down by so and so i've been let down it's it's not like that it's 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 literally it's out of people's capabilities you know it's, so i think the first the first thing to do is to if you've got a a, a long term relationship with your supplier being, you know, UK or abroad, you sit down and you have discussions with them and say, look, what is going to happen now? And what is going to happen for next year? And what are you doing about this? And and realistically, I need to know now what you can or can't produce for next year. Um, I personally... I'm a bit of a belt and braces person and, and I would I would want to secure layers of security. So you would perhaps have some sourced from UK and some sourced from abroad because it could be our turn next year. It could be, you know, we, we could we could we could be uh we could be struggling, you know, um you said earlier on there was one or two uh, game farms uh, this year that that got closed down. That's that's true. So don't cut off, or don't burn your bridges, basically. Yeah, and so so for anybody who then is looking for a new game farm, and or maybe for a supplier who's got who, whose supply comes from somewhere other than France, have you got any advice for people who would? you know what to look for when choosing a game farm particularly given that they may never have actually been there and seen it or worked with them before what are the things to to look out for uh, yeah well that's that's a very interesting one I, I suppose if you 
it, it, it depends on your level, your level of knowledge, really, isn't it? Um, if if uh, you are, if you know what your or your keeper knows um, what goes on or what should go on on a game farm, then um, you know the sort of questions to ask. Or ideally, you know, if you can go and visit and you can see, if you can go and see his breeding pens and see. Like he's got a decent amount of hens there. You've got some idea that um, what he's suggesting is giving um, is a reality or not. You know, possibly you know, ask uh, ask somebody to step in with with a bit of uh, knowledge to help you with that. Yeah, so word of mouth's a good good way to go, isn't it? You know, if there's somebody you know and trust who's been using them, then that's not a bad way, is it? But really, you should ask, you should ask the origins of the stock, you know, and, and what vets they're using. Uh, you need, need to have a, a, a game bird vet um, and, you know, um, how they're doing. I mean, ideally, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about self-regulation at the moment. And if, if someone is audited by a third party, um, then you've got that security. What about internationally? For let's say I, I've been approached by a few game farm or a few keepers who said I want to go and set up a game farm in X country or Y country to cope with this situation. Now I don't don't know that's a whole other topic of conversation. But um, how do you is there is there auditing or are there any things you could do if you're looking at a game farm in a foreign country that actually you can't go and see and there is no word of mouth? Do you know I think that's that's just such a difficult. I mean in the UK that's one thing. Uh, you you can you can go. Um, I think you could go. Yeah, if you went to visit, you would need someone with experience to go with you, and to look, and you can see that they are an established place and they have been around for some time. If you if you're going to somewhere that where they're literally just setting up now, they haven't got a, a name or a reputation to to uh, lose, so they can they can sell you the eggs. And then five minutes later, sell them to someone else as they're in transit. I think that that sounds all too familiar, sadly. And so then uh, domestic supply then. Um, there is, as you explained earlier, there's a reason we go to France for partridge in particular, the climate being a major factor. But how much of that production could potentially be done in the UK? Is the climate just a just a, a total barrier to that or, or is there any way that we could sort of hedge by moving some of that partridge supply into the UK? So um, personally I don't actually run my own uh, partridge uh, breeding uh, program so I wouldn't know uh, exact comparisons of um, the number of eggs um, you can get from here uh, as from there but I do know it is significant this is bordering on another issue that the sector is facing and that is the potential banning of raised cages as you may know that partridges tend to be um, bred in smaller cages as pairs rather than flock mating Um, and this has been a very successful program for many years but unfortunately it's not really seen politically um, as the way we should be doing things in this day and age Um, this is this is uh, the views in Europe at the moment and again in the UK the animal welfare bill um they are looking to um, move away from cage type systems so if we lose that then partridge producing is going to get much much harder Uh, and we're looking at that anyway so i i can see that over the next few years we've got a lot of ground to cover and so something that the gfa has done to um broach this is we've set up a working group with various uh uk game farms uh and we're looking into um alternative systems to breed partridge on more of a flock mating system Whatever happens, partridge production is going to be more limited. It's going to be more labour intensive and therefore more expensive. And there are some people who've been trialling flock mating partridge 
this year, I believe, or, or over the last few years. And, and some people say they've nailed it, um, which is always encouraging to hear. It is, but they're all they are all um, on a small scale, and we have to get it to more of a commercial scale, and that's the hard bit. Now that there, there is partridge production in Spain and Portugal, and I believe that they will, you know, increase their production out there, so that will help. Um, and I believe that some game farms are looking to other countries like Hun- Hungary. And actually, the predecessor to the Game Farmers Association, the Game Egg Guild, and we're talking well over 100 years ago, was set up to guarantee um, that they would only buy eggs, these these, uh, grey partridge from Hungary. So here we are 100 years later, and we're looking um, back to these other countries to help us. It all goes round. What goes round? It it also raises another interesting question and and quite a hot topic of debate which is that of catching up versus overwintering yeah um, and i've spoken to a couple of vets about my capacity this year and and they think that there's going to be a real there's going to be a for a few facts partly because there's been a lot more caught up stock this year from all over the country um is that yeah what what are your thoughts on catching up stock as a shoot to guarantee your laying birds for next year um, would you hold back some of your some of your faults early? If- I'm sort of I'm I've been saying recently that what we need as a sector is we need like a, a UK strategy to mitigate avian flu, microplasma, and border controls. The the, the problem with the the uh, sector is it is so fragmented, and and one person will do one thing, and somebody will do something else. So how we stand to collaborate. It almost seems to be an impossible task, but it would be nice to create a, a movement um, and and uh, like a progression and, and and put in some solid foundations for our future. And catching up hens is just in the past, and and that's where the French really uh, took over and helped us from those days where we were catching up, like I said earlier, uh, and, and producing birds that don't fly. But again, as you pointed out, um, over the last few years, we've seen this horrible disease, this mycoplasma, um, that you just can't get rid of if you're constantly picking up birds from the wild. And um, if people are expecting to be catching up birds this this season, after, a, um, you know, uh, a depleted release anyway, and there's going to be so many days shooting. There's not going to be that many hens around and you're pooling from various different places in that situation. And so you're just, you're just putting all, all the disease in one spot. Um, so yeah, mycoplasma is inevitable, but also a, with avian flu, DEFRA could suddenly say, what are you doing? Catching up wild birds and breeding from them, then spreading them all over the UK. So it's not a stable plan for, for the future. It sounds a bit like what you're saying is that there are so many challenges and so many unknowns that actually, if you'll forgive the pun, we shouldn't be putting all of our eggs in one basket in any sense of the word. Um, we should be trying to find systems that mitigate against relying too heavily on one source or um uh, you know, we, as you said earlier, you know, we could have an outbreak here in the UK next year, it com- com- comparable to the one that they had in France. And if everybody switched their production to, you know, producing their own laying stock and their own eggs, then we're back in the same boat, aren't we? I did say in what I think my newsletter or something, um, I, I wrote, uh, if ever you wondered which came first, this is the year to give you the answer. Because if you didn't have any hens, you certainly didn't have any eggs. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like I was saying, it it gives you a layer of security. It doesn't give you the answer. It doesn't give you complete confidence. It it is one step towards that, you know. And and I I would suggest that any game farm with any, you know, rearing production this year and any pulse on their field, consider keeping some hens back, even if it's just a few, you know. And again, any shoots that are receiving, lucky to be receiving any pulse, consider keeping some hens i mean if you kept 500 hens you could have the potential of of um 
you know, obtaining 20,000 eggs next year, which you could, you should be able to get 70 odd percent on that. So 14,000 chicks. Now, okay, the problem with that is that will be spread over 10 weeks, which is not, you know, great for a shoot, but you could, again, collaboration, you could um, work with other shoots. So there's, there's things that we can do, collaboration with other game farms and other shoots, satellite breeding units, but if they're done, they have to be done properly, and I would suggest done with a game bird vet. It's interesting because it, it's, it sounds fantastic, but it all comes down, or unfortunately, a lot of it comes down to cost, doesn't it? Yes. We've seen quite a lot this year of hyperinflated, I mean, really hyperinflated costs of eggs. I mean, I know someone who was selling some for £3.50 the other day when they're normally, well, what are they, normally 60p, um, and poults being sold for £12 when they're normal, well, a couple of years ago, they're £3.90. Are, are we going to see, first of all, are we going to see those prices go down? do you think, or are they now, perhaps not the extremes, but are they set high for quite a while? Um, and what would your cost benefit analysis be um, in terms of uh, overwintering your stock versus catching up? Because that's what people will say. They'll say it's too expensive. I, I worked out my predicted price for a breeding stock as of March next year. And and as, as a game farmer that always overwinters, we work our program like we worked our program for next year in January this year. So historically, when people ring up and ask um, when when would you like our request for pulse, uh, I I would say to them, well, last year when I was picking out my stock would have been good, but um, we we uh, we're predicting next March it's going to cost fifteen pound a, a hen, um, and I must admit the figures I was using for that were based on a, uh, a sale, pulp sale price of about £4.80 and also wheat prices of about £250 a tonne. So obviously wheat prices are going higher than that. So yeah, I'm a little bit uncertain what it is, So, but we can say it's in excess of £15 a hen. Yeah. So that is a huge amount of capital and um, if, if you're talking, you know, two or three thousand hens um, that somebody's got to commit to this year. And again, going back to catching up, if somebody was to catch up next year, they could they could buy those uh, hens uh, X shoot for a hell of a lot less. Um, and so on that basis, we'd been working out that to overwinter, it's basically about 25p an egg more. To put it into perspective, is it worth it? I mean, I, I think the answer. I think the answer is yes because of the the disease. But what what would you do? We, we, you were talking about this joint up approach, and it needs more of us to get behind this. It's not an easy task. That's why the French took it on back in the eighties. In this climate, it's not easy to do uh, to run a breeding program, and. There are management skills that are largely, I was going to say unknown, but there's there's not many people that that are used to used to running a breeding program. So that so you know that there is uh, a certain amount of education, but the vets at the moment are doing multiple uh, training days in this, that, and the other. So I think we can overcome that. And I think again, if if shoots were to have like small units initially, and you learn on smaller sizes, your 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 costs aren't going to be so bad if something does go wrong. Uh, I think uh, a five hundred bird unit is very manageable for one person. Really interesting. As this news filters down, and shoots learn that they're not getting their birds, and guns have their days cancelled, and and all the rest of it, there's going to be a bit of a hue and cry from within our world. And there will be those who will say that the organizations or the government or whoever haven't done enough. But it feels to me that our little world doesn't have the best public image for better, you know, rightly or wrongly. There are those who don't like what we do. And it's a bit tricky situation at the best of times. And we haven't got problems. It feels to me like there's a bit of a PR thing that we need to get right at this stage and we sort of i think and i think we sort of touched on it already digby you were talking about you know the the overall impact on the rural economy and not focusing on you know 
the press image would be, you know, city boys can't shoot their pheasants. Poor little poor little lambs. But that's that's overlooking the wider picture and and where there's a potential, you know, if 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 we're going to to win any sort of PR battle over this, I think that that's a really important message that we need to keep an eye on is not slamming the people who've been trying to sort it out, but focus on what can be done for the future and on securing those livelihoods. Does that sound fair? I couldn't agree more. I think that's, I think the PR or the angle we go down when we're talking about it and, and what we're set, writing about and talking about, um, we've got to focus on the rural economy, on people's lives and livelihoods. Um, shooting, after all, is only a tiny, tiny proportion of what actually happens. And if you if you think of how many shoot, well, I think the, 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 shoot, the average shoot shoots 13, 14 days, is it, George, in the UK? Fewer, yeah. You guys are the, the guys with the information. That's that, yeah. But yeah, if we if we were to, from a public point of view, if we were to point out what we're doing for the 300 days in the year, yeah. not just the few days when we're out there pulling the trigger, is their perception of shooting because of the name shooting in the title. They just think that's all we're doing. But um, the, the investment, the time, we 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 are the custodians of our countryside. We if without shooting and hunting, what would the countryside look like? It'd be arable fields. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and we've got a message to to get out there. And we, I suppose, this does give us an opportunity now to to rebuild a new shooting future. And we should bear in mind all of these things that we need to address. Yeah, and it, I mean, if you if the you know if the worst does happen, and I'm sure it will for for many people, if your shoot does go to the wall, then all those man hours of conservation work that is essentially privately funded conservation will just cease to happen, and you know the those wild bird strips won't be there, the woodlands won't be managed, and so on and so forth. And so I think that that is another really key element to to how we think about this and how we talk about this in the corridors of the, of power and in and. You know, if it does make it into the national press in in those arenas as well, uh, I really like what you said there, um, George Davis, not George Brown. Um, or I like what you said, George, too. But <laughs> 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 about this, this could be uh, in every every cloud has a silver lining. I mean, I, it is it is generally it's disastrous what what's happening. But um, can we use this to to form a bit more of a joined up approach for the future? Can we? Um, start thinking more collectively about um, our overwintering programs. Can we start um, minimising risk next year? All, all those sorts of things. Could we use, see this as a bit of an opportunity, um, as tough as it is for, for so many of us? Um, uh, yeah, really interesting, George. I, I, w- I would like to see um, a, a focus on, on the day. I, I think... Um, it's it's not just about pulling the trigger. It's 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 the whole package, isn't it? And you know how in lockdown, all the restaurants and pubs they had to rethink. They had to do blue sky thinking. They had to come up with different solutions for their businesses to survive. And you know we've got to do the same thing. And if 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 you've got some birds, but not not what you would normally have. I think first of all you've got to you've got to discuss expectations you've got to talk to the guns and you've got to say we can't do physically can't do what we normally do we've got to do something else but rather than not have all your days and say sorry we can't do this let's make the most of what we have got and maybe combine say simulated day with you know, uh, some drives simulated, some drives live birds, you know, just to eke out. And it actually, in lots of situations, it might help uh, sharpen up a few guns at the beginning of the day to have a few clays first. <laughs> and then we'd get a better return anyway. So it's not just about, you know, shooting birds. It's about being out with your friends in this countryside of ours and enjoying the whole day, you know. Here, here. And we we need to maybe refocus on that and the quality of the food that we're creating as well. You know, the nutrients that are coming from these wild birds um, outstrip any 
chicken, I suppose. Not that I want to set up, set up any sort of competition or anything, but, but um, it is it is a high value product. Yeah. And and we should be worshipping it almost like, you know, how in France and Spain, you know, how, how they worship their foods. Uh, and we should. That's what it's about. Absolutely. Well, George, I, I think that's probably, I mean, there's a hell of a lot of information in there. Um all really interesting and I think hopefully really helpful. But um, thank you ever so much for taking the time to join us today. Yeah. It's been really interesting. Thank you, George, very much indeed. Thank you very much. Right. So as I said, I hope everybody listening has found this special edition helpful and enlightening, um, even if at times it's maybe a little bit depressing. It is a bit of a departure from the usual tone of the podcast, but as we said at the beginning, it is a really important subject. And I think everybody involved in shooting in whatever capacity does need to understand the situation more broadly if you are a shoot owner or a gamekeeper and you've been listening to this and you think you'd enjoy more regular podcast aimed specifically at people who do run shoots drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com and if we get enough interest we might have a think about starting up a more regular podcast chris and i will be back with series five of the guns on pegs podcast proper uh, in not too long at all. Um, we've already got uh, the first episode more or less booked in uh, to record, and we've got a couple of very exciting special guests for the first few episodes uh, lined up. Um, so look forward to that. Until then, thanks very much for listening, and goodbye.